somebody doesn't show up in class, they're going to get a phone call from the, the school and they're going to say, hey, where were you? Is everything OK? Is you need help? Is there anything that we can do? And, and uh, that doesn't happen in the other. That's not going to happen. It, I went to Florida State University you know, what, and p- pick your school in the country. Uh, you're not going to get a phone call if you don't show up for class. But in our schools, you do because they want the student to succeed. They're invested in the success of the student. They, they want a positive outcome and they're going to do everything they can to make it happen. Welcome to Mosaic Minds, the podcast where every episode is a colorful blend of perspectives, ideas, and conversation. Each week, our diverse team of hosts brings their unique backgrounds, experiences, and interests to the table. Mosaic Minds is your invitation to join the conversation to see the world through a kaleidoscope of viewpoints. So grab a seat, tune in, and let the mosaic unfold before you. Welcome to another episode of Mosaic Minds Podcast. My name is Nick, and to my right is Jason. And today we are joined by Dr. Jason Altmeyer. He is the president of Career Education Colleges and Universities, known as CQ. And he's a former congressman and a published author, and he's done plenty other things. But today we're having him on to talk about for-profit colleges and trade schools kind of how they're looked at by um, by the government and by just, just by people in general and why they're looked at the way that they are. So welcome to the show, Jason. And if you could, um, if you could just give us kind of a little background about you and kind of what brought you to what you're doing now as president of CQ. Sure. So CQ is an acronym, C-E-C-U. And as you said, it stands for Career Education Colleges and Universities. And we, as an association, are the national association that represents private post-secondary career schools. And we're going to talk about that. But we have 1,100 campuses and affiliate members across North America. We have an alliance with Canada as well. And we represent all types of career schools, aviation, technicians, auto techs, nursing, the allied health fields in medical, cosmetology, culinary, all types of blue collar trades, the welders, truck drivers, underwater construction divers, offshore wind turbines. And uh, we have a school in Louisiana that trains the offshore oil rigs guys. And the, uh, we have school in Wyoming that does ranching. So all types of, of careers uh, among those 1,100 campuses. And I've been doing this. I lead the association, and I've been doing it for about four years now. And I, it came about because I spent actually most of my career in business, primarily in healthcare. I worked for two very large multi-billion dollar healthcare companies. And in between those two stints, I did it some time in Congress. I served three terms as a, in the U.S. House of Representatives. And uh, during that time, I served on the Higher Education Subcommittee as a Democrat. We're going to talk about some of the political issues related to private post-secondary education. And this was during a time in the Obama administration when for-profit schools were under attack uh, heavily regulated, heavily scrutinized, and, and uh, in some quarters criticized. And uh, I had schools in my district. I traveled around the country and visited some schools and got to know the sector and, and see the value. So uh, that was my record in, in politics with regard to career schools. And then uh, when CQ went through a planned transition in 2020, Obviously, like this year, that was an election year, and uh, they knew that there was a possibility that uh, there was going to be a change and there'd be Democrats in the White House. And they felt like they wanted somebody who could work with both sides and and, uh, get along with both Republicans and Democrats, which I definitely did during my time in Congress. And uh, uh, I've enjoyed the work. It's really been a benefit to have the political background, but to uh, also have a background when I was first starting in the role in the sector of the career education sector. And I I really enjoy the work and 
uh, we continue to fight for our schools. Okay, great. Um, why do you think, though, so I mentioned earlier that there's a certain perception of um, of for-profit schools and trade schools. Why do you think that for-profit colleges are often regarded negatively by the government and some sectors of the public? We are a heavily regulated sector, uh, without question. And, and uh, generally speaking, there are a great number of exceptions on the Democratic side, but generally speaking, it's the Democratic uh, politicians who have expressed concern with really, you know, there, there's two things that, that happen. Uh, you know, there are some that just have an ideological bias against for-profit involvement really in, in anything, you anything, know, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm not going to go as far as to say, you know, they don't like capitalism altogether, but they have concerns about the profit motive, generally speaking, it just in business, but in education in particular, they're very concerned. And that includes charter schools, K through 12, online program managers who work with schools, you know, the vendors, and yes, uh, for-profit career schools, for-profit colleges and universities. And uh, those are the folks that, uh, you know, are heavily critical. Uh, and the other thing that has happened, and this is true, is there have been bad actors in the sector. There have been, in some cases, very large schools, high profile, that have not conducted themselves the way anyone would have liked. Students were harmed as a result. Those schools are now out of business, but they cast, they, you know, there's a black eye on the sector and, and they, they cast everyone in a bad light because of their actions. And uh, those are the things that people remember. So part of the criticism comes from real world experience from members of Congress and, and regulators with having to deal with those issues and those, you know, the larger schools where there was the high profile issues, that was about 10 years ago, but we still hear about it and it has tainted the reputation of career schools for some. Um, but the other issue is there really is just an ideological disposition among some in the democratic party, uh, you know, just to, just to be concerned in general. So we deal with both of those issues. Can you could you share some of the success stories that CQ has has had um, when it comes to involving politicians and getting them out to campuses or getting them involved? Yeah, it's critically important. Senator Durbin is the number one critic of the for profit education sector, higher ed. He absolutely wakes up every day thinking about it. He gives Senate speeches and doesn't say very nice things and goes out of his way in every possible way to make it very difficult for for-profit schools to conduct business and, and you know, continue to serve students. Um, you know, CQ was not involved in Senator Durbin's visit to the AIM campus in Chicago. That, that was the AIM folks who did that. It was amazing that they got him there because that's an incredible campus, a great story to tell, great outcomes, fantastic facilities. And the fact that they were able to bring in Senator Durbin um, was a huge benefit not just to aim, but to the entire sector for him to see that there really are quality schools, because I don't think he believed that there were. So that was not a CQ thing. That was an aim thing. But we we do spend a lot of time, uh, both CQ, the, our, the team, me and our team, just traveling around, visiting schools, seeing firsthand the work that they do and the services that they provide for students. But it's really important to get policymakers on those campuses. So we've worked very hard and worked with schools all across the country to bring senators, congressmen, regulators, governors, state legislators to see firsthand what happens at those campuses, to see the facilities, the technology, and most importantly, the faces of the students. There is nothing like having that conversation with a student. And these are people often who've gone through difficult times. Single moms, veterans returning from the workforce, people being downsized, going through a divorce, you know, whatever it might be, and uh, maybe working one or two jobs on the side, really non-traditional students. And 
the fact that our students are able to to offer them a high quality education and get them into a new career is amazing. It's life changing and it's very fulfilling for me. And I hope for the elected officials that visit to see those students and to hear their stories. And equally important are the stories of the employers that hire those students. And the best campus visits feature employers because those are third party validators. They can talk about the value that they place upon having that school as a pipeline to helping to solve the skills gap that you hear about the, the, you know, the people in high demand professions, there aren't enough of them. I told you the careers that are represented among our schools. Many of them are, are high demand professions where, where there are, is great need and there's going to be more need in the future. You think about nursing, truck driving, there's, there's an 80,000 truck driver shortage right now. Um, HVAC, welding, uh, any any type. We talked about auto techs and aviation techs. Those are professions where there's there's a gap in between the skills that are necessary, the number of people that are qualified to do the job, and our schools fill that need. So having the employer tell that story provides that third party validation. So that that's why we think it's really important for policymakers to visit the schools. For those of us like Jason and I that are that are in the sector. What are what are some recommendations that you would have to um, to solicit getting out politicians, getting politicians to come to the campus? I think sometimes I have found, you know, because I've been on both sides of it. Uh, in addition to my current role and having served in Congress, I was also a government relations person um, for for business. And um, you know, I, I think sometimes people who are not in elected office or aren't used to dealing with politicians get intimidated or, or they don't think they have standing to bring a legislator to their district. And I think what they forget is you're their boss, right? I mean, right. They, the voter is the boss and, and uh, any elected official should want to see that campus. There are some, as I said, that don't like for-profit schools, don't want to be seen there, think it's a political liability, and you're never going to get them. But I think those are few and far between. Most members of Congress and regulators, certainly, but also even state legislators, um, should want to go and see. Uh, if you're involved, even as a regulator, if you're involved in that issue, your daily career it revolves around thinking about or in some way, you know, touches career schools, you should want to be educated in the subject with which you're you're doing business. So it, it's really valuable for them to see. Now for an elected official, they you know, they 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 want to learn, hopefully, if you're if you're good at what you do and, and they're a quality elected official, you know, you should want to learn, but at minimum, every elected official wants to see voters and get reelected. And when they go to schools, they're going to see faculty, they're going to see students, they're going to see administrators, and probably they're going to see employers, large employers sometimes who are very important and prominent in their district. So that's a home run for any elected mm -hmm. official. In addition to, I think the more important aspect of educating them and the opportunity to learn. Sure. I think tipping my cap to you, you know, my family has about 80 years in the education sector and it's a privilege to speak with you. And quite frankly, it's an honor, you know, moving forward. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the cross section between politics and the sector that you're currently in with the jobs in Indianapolis, the jobs in uh, Philadelphia, the jobs in Pittsburgh, since you're familiar with that Philadelphia area, the Pittsburgh area. Talk to me a little bit about how the sector that we have and that you're part of services those main um, brick and mortar positions within the cities that, that were aforementioned? Yeah, it, it's all over the country, but we have this conversation all the time with people who don't like the for-profit schools. I mean, there are some that literally wake up every day and they want to put for-profit schools out of business. And we ask them this question, 85% of cosmetologists that have a certificate come from a for-profit school. They got their training and education at a for-profit school. More than half the truck drivers in the country got their training at a for-profit school. You're with AIM, and as you're well aware, AIM by themselves trains 25% of aviation technicians, but 
40% of aviation technicians across the country receive their education and training at a for-profit school. Same for auto technicians, 66%, two thirds of allied health professionals. So dental assisting, medical assisting, and, and other allied health come from a for-profit school. So, so we ask the question, where are you, where are you going to get these people? If, if, if you're going to put our schools out of business and you're going to prevent students from receiving that education and that very valuable training and, and help in that pipeline for high demand jobs, where are they going to come from? Uh, so if, you know, the example I use related to aviation tax, if you're sitting on an airplane and you look at those men and women working around the plane, you want two things. You want them to be really good at what they do and you want there to be a lot of them. And if you put the for-profit schools out of business, you're going to lose 40% of the pipeline mm -hmm. for just those jobs. And again, it, it, it translates across various professions. 25% of the nurses in the country come from a for-profit school. Uh, welders, about, about 20, 25% of welders as well. So, uh, you know, HVAC, but during the summer, and, and uh, you know, in the Sun Belt, you you need HVAC. You, 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 the, those are very valuable. And, and when you call someone, you want them to be available. So we we have that conversation all the time with the policymakers that, you know, there is a huge consequence to going down the road of making it difficult for for profit schools to serve students because you're going to lose the pipeline for jobs that are very important in the country. Yeah. Whether it's um, whether it's policymakers or whether it's taxpayers, what are some of the common misconceptions about career colleges that that you have to um, that you have to address? What well, the, the misconceptions vary. And, and uh, you know, I think most most normal people and by normal, I mean, non politicians, you know, I can say that having <laughs> been a politician myself, yeah. but. Um, you know, politicians live in a different world, right? And they have different motivations. But most most folks are just normal people who wake up every day thinking about something other than politics. They wonder who's their sports team playing tonight. What time's my kid's activity? What do we got planned for the weekend? Whatever. They're not thinking about politics. And they're certainly not thinking about who owns the school or, or what's the tax structure of a college that's nearby. Uh, so I don't know that there's a, a misconception among the general public. I don't think they even realize that there is a difference, that there is such a thing as a nonprofit school. There's certainly public schools and community colleges, and then there's for-profit schools. And when people see these schools and they know people that have gone there or they'll see a commercial on TV, I don't think they think, oh, that's a for-profit school. So therefore I'm going to have some different opinion about them. They just kind of view them all the same and they're all important. But the politicians, of course, view them and think about that. And, uh, the, you know, the concerns that are raised about them is the quality of the program, the outcome for students, certainly the cost, you know, and yeah. on, on quality, we will take that comparison every day of the week. And there's really two sides of the for-profit sector. It's important to point this out. Uh, it, you know, and th this applies all across higher education, but for for-profit schools, you, you have two sides. You have the four-year online liberal arts schools, you know, that they're serving students in a way that they get a bachelor's degree or higher, master's, even doctorate. But then you have the career schools that we're talking about that for the most part, our certificate programs or, or AAs, um, nursing programs can go all the way up to to doctorate. So can you know, uh, cybersecurity and some other some other programs. But for the most part, you, you have the online four year schools, and then you have the career schools, the hands on skilled trades. And there's a difference there. And in higher education, there's a move towards more online programs and that, you know, Penn State Global, Southern New Hampshire, Maryland Global. It's not just in the for-profit sector. And people understand the difference. And the challenge of looking at outcomes in 
those programs is students join online programs for different reasons. Um, again, non-traditional students sometimes, but sometimes they don't even intend to finish the program. They want to take a few classes and learn a few things. It's just very difficult. So in any sector of higher education, the online programs have a greater challenge than the in-person programs. But when our critics compare our schools, they conflate all of that. They lump them all together in a way that they don't do when they look at programs in other sides of the sector. So we will, if you want to look at the outcomes of career schools, all of those programs I talked about, all the careers that, that we're training people to get into, um, we will compare ourselves to community college. You want to look at graduation rates? Please do so. Please look at the graduation rates of community colleges and compare them to the graduation yeah. rates of our career schools. Our, ours, to be accredited, you have to have a 70% plus graduation rate for most accreditors. Uh, you're not going to find a community college, I don't think, anywhere in the country that has a 75 or 70% graduation rate. But on average, the average in the country is about 25%. Many are, you know, an average is an average. So it's half of them are lower approximately and half are higher, um, but they're all lower than ours. Um, we will certainly look at uh, job placement rates. Now, they'll criticize us based upon cost and cost is going to be different because our schools are not subsidized in the same way that community colleges are. Community colleges get huge public subsidies taxpayer funded subsidies from states and even from the federal government. But a lot of that flows through the states, hundreds of millions of dollars. So that offsets the cost of tuition. And it's why in many community colleges, the costs are much lower. And in some states, community colleges are now free, especially for low income people. You're starting to see a move in that direction. So yes, there's a difference on cost. But we in our sector are serving a different student mix. They're students, again, non-traditional. They might need a lot of flexibility in their programs, ability to go to school at night. I can promise you our student services are superior to, or equal or better than anywhere that, that you will find. There's many good for pro, or nonprofit and public schools with student services, but we prioritize that. And when you look at all of that together, we want people to to take a look at those those outcomes. You know, please take a look at the way we serve students. If you're, I'm sure at your campus, but you know, really any of our schools that I have visited, I've been very impressed because I always hear the story: somebody doesn't show up in class, they're going to get a phone call right from yeah. the, the school, <laughs> and they're going to say, "Hey, where were you? Is everything okay? Is you need help? Is there anything that we can do?" And, and uh, that doesn't happen in the other. That's not going to happen. It, I went to Florida State University. Yeah, what? And pick, pick your school in the country. Uh, you're not going to get a phone call if you don't show up for class. But in our schools, you do because they want the student to succeed. They're invested in the success of the student. They they want a positive outcome, and they're going to do everything they can to make it happen. Yeah, I'm glad that you. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the cost variation because. That was one thing. I mean, because essentially the career schools are helping to pay for the um, traditional colleges, right? Because we're paying taxes while the, uh, you know, while the universities and the state schools and the community colleges are um, being given um, money from the government. It's true. Yeah, it's another aspect. And, and we have a foundation uh, at CQ. It's called the CQ Research Foundation. And we're commissioning studies on that very issue, on the community impact and, and the, the total cost to the, the taxpayer of a student's choice in higher education, because our schools do pay taxes and there, and there is a benefit to the community for our schools being there and, and expanding the tax base. But if you're a student and you can choose a nonprofit setting for a program, you can choose a community college or public setting, or you could choose a for-profit school, the student will have different personal costs based upon that choice because they can access Pell Grants, they can access student loans, which they ha will have to repay. Uh, you know, there's a big debate about sometimes now you don't have to 
repay, but let's just <laughs> yeah. say, yeah. The, you know, the, the theory behind a loan is you're supposed to pay it back at the end. You're, you're obligating yourself. So um, these students do have a different cost based upon that choice. But what's the cost to the taxpayer? Because if they go to a community college for free to the student, Student's not going to have any costs, but somebody's paying for that. It's not going to, it's not going to be the student, but who's paying for that? The taxpayer is paying for it. What is the cost of that? And again, this is an institution that is not paying taxes, that is getting public subsidies, often hundreds of millions of dollars. So the cost to the taxpayer is actually much greater in that setting than it is at a for-profit school, which is not getting a subsidy. So we're, we're taking a look at that in the research. And that, that is a story that has not been told uh, as much as it should be in the public domain. From an industry expert like yourself, um, if I look at it like this, let's say I'm not on the Democratic side. Let's say I'm not on the Republican side. Let's just say I'm non-political, okay? What's your biggest emphasis or bullet point that you would try to sway someone to say, hey, it's an important sector, um, non-political, non, non-for-profit versus for-profit? Uncover that question for me a little bit. You know, we, we don't like, you know, although this whole conversation has kind of been about this because we're looking at it from that side of things, but, you know, we, we don't like to compare or, or dissuade people from choosing a different setting if it works for them. There's different yeah. reasons why people choose different settings. So, you know, we, we don't say, you know, in all cases, our sector is the best choice for a student. It, it may, maybe it's not. Maybe the student has life circumstances that would lead them to a different, you know, maybe the school's closer, the geography is important, whatever it might be. Maybe they like the teacher, the class size is important. What, 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 you know, there's different factors. So, so we don't like to make that comparison. But for the general public, I think it's you, what the most important factor is. All of these things we're talking about are important. Outcomes, the type of student, non-traditional, all, all the things that we've, we've mentioned earlier. But the, I would say the most important issue that I find really the light bulb goes off at people. Like when I'm out at a neighborhood event and people say, what do you do? And we you know, you have the conversation. When I start listing those stats about the percentage of occupations where the workers come from a for-profit school. And that's when you see the light bulb. Like I had no idea. I had no idea that more than half the truck drivers in the country were trained at a the truck, a for-profit trucking school. Um, and all, all the things I've listed before, aviation techs and all the rest. So I think if you ask me what's the most important thing that really hits home for just the average person who doesn't think about these things every day, I think I think it's those numbers that put it in perspective. I love the direction you took that question because being admissions, being um, probably about 75% of the programs that you've mentioned, I've worked or presented. And I think the number one thing that I can tell you is after that graduation seeing a father come up to you and say, my son is the first generation, which is in turn going to impact two or three generations after that. So I second, I second that opinion and view that you had. I really like seeing and understanding that and just knowing that I was just a small part of that. You know, the participation, mm -hmm. the retention, the graduation, the excitement, and it just gives me cold chills to, to wonder, you know, their grandchild is probably going to go to college because of the result that they made during that generation. So you're absolutely right on that. Yeah, that was one thing at the conference that I really, that was kind of the general theme was, you know, everybody that was there that I could tell anyway, had a true, you know, passion for the students. And I thought that was, that was pretty amazing. And I'm not going to say that, that at a traditional college or at a community college that they don't have that, but I would be surprised if it was as great as it is uh, for, um, you know, for the career colleges, you know, and I, I've, I've even, and I, I agree with you. I think that there's a, a place for, for all the schools and you should go to wherever's best for you. But um, in my opinion, and this may be a little cynical for somebody that works in education, but in my opinion, if, if you don't have a plan, um, it's, it's kind of a waste of money. In my opinion, I've told my kids that I'm like, if you don't have a plan, then, you know, like, let's, let's figure it out first. My, my oldest child, she goes to a, a traditional college. And then my, um, my, 
my son that's a senior this year in high school, um, I'm, I'm actually trying to get him to come to, uh, <laughs> to where I work, you know, cause, cause I think he'd be great at that, you know, and I think that's, that would be more his thing. He's very intelligent, but I don't think he, he's kind of like me. I don't know that he would want to do, um, a bunch of papers and, and read a whole bunch of books and, you know, and, and all that. So I think you're right. I think it just, I think there's a place for, for all of them, but you just, I think it, the big theme, especially with career schools is you have to have, you need to have a plan. And, you know, those are so pointed to a certain industry or a certain uh, vocation that um, I think that's one of the advantages that, that those, those kind of schools have. You kind of lead me in, in a, little bit different direction, which is important to talk about, and that is the role of of women students in career education, um, which I'll get to. And the reason I thought of it is is this issue that you're talking about with having a plan. And what you find with career schools generally is students are much more motivated to succeed than they would be at a traditional four-year school where maybe they haven't quite figured out what they want to do yet. It's going to take them a while to assimilate. They're taking general education studies that are not of great interest to them. But if you choose a career school, especially if you're a non-traditional student going through a tough time, maybe a little bit later in life, and you've got family obligations and maybe a job on the side to juggle, you are going to make it work. You're there for a reason, and, and you do have a plan. And the reason that made me think of women students is incredibly and very in a very positively um, many of these, especially the skilled trades. Now, the nursing programs and even the allied health programs are, are majority women. You know, they're, they're mostly women. There, there are a lot of men that go through that career path, too. But for the skilled trades, that's traditionally been men overwhelmingly 90 percent plus men but more and more you're seeing women get into these programs and i'm talking about welders truck drivers construction heavy equipment you know the 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 you know get your hands dirty type jobs aviation techs which which you all do um more women so and, and aim has prioritized getting more women the outreach and, and expanding the student population. And what we have found, I, I'm sure this is the case with AIM as well, but in all those professions, the women actually end up doing better than the men on average. They, they, they're they just more apt, you know, the aptitude. But the reason I believe, this is just my own theory, but just having observed it, is if you are a woman who goes into that setting a profession and a field of study that's 90 plus percent men in a get your hands dirty type, you know, job, you're going to, you're going to want it. You're, you're doing that because you have an, a, an aptitude for it. You like it. You see it as a, as a good career for you and you're there for all the right reasons and you're there to succeed. And men, you know, they're there too, but for the same reasons, but the women are just singularly focused on, I'm going to show them and I'm going to do this and succeed. So it's really gratifying to see the attitude that these students have, especially the women when they come in and they know in some cases, this might be their last chance. They might've tr tried another setting of higher education. It, it didn't work out and they might've tried, you know, they transferred over from a different school or they've been out of school for a while um, but in some cases, they're just going through a career change, but it's something they want to do and they're highly motivated to succeed. That's true. That's true. Cause you, cause like I'd say 10 years ago at AIM, we had far, far less, our, our demographic of women to men was far less, but yeah, we have quite a few now. And, um, I mean, I'd say at every graduation that we've been to, there's been, you know, three, four out of, you know, we don't have huge graduations. So, but I'd say every graduation that we've been to, there's been at least what, three or four, I would say. But yeah. It's crazy how, how much has changed um, just in within the decade. Oh, absolutely. And you're, you're seeing it, but I'm seeing that very story all across the country at those schools. When you see like um, the studying that you're doing and the programs that you're rolling out, do you see any emergent programs that maybe haven't been mentioned that are, I don't want to go political, but like, maybe some programs that you feel like are either underutilized. I know you mentioned truck driving. I know aviation. 
what's maybe another program that the general public wouldn't be aware of that's underserved and maybe one new program that you see maybe a two, three, five year horizon out? Technology has changed things so much. You always see this stat and I don't have it in front of me. I, I forget exactly what it is, but some large percentage of jobs that people are going to have 10 years from now don't exist today because technology is going to take it in a place where we don't envision it. And this is a big problem with education is you want to keep up. You want to train people for jobs that are going to be there in 10 years, not jobs that were here 10 years ago. It's a big problem with public education. Our schools address that issue. I, I would say some of the fields that people might not think about that are growing that are things that you're going to see a lot more of. We have a school in Texas that does commercial drone application, trains people in the commercial use of drones. Uh, and you think about all the ways 10 years from now we're going to use drones in, in every possible way for construction and you know site evaluation, home delivery, all, all, every possible way you can imagine. That's a huge one. Uh, Cybersecurity is an enormous one information technology, but especially cybersecurity, that might be the fastest growing field that we see across our schools. That's saying, you know, that's a high bar. We have a lot of high growth areas, but um, tremendous opportunity in cybersecurity if you get into it. So I, I, I would say those kind of technology related fields are, uh, you know, we, we have some schools that do entertainment uh you know, training students you know, to be behind the camera, film production, entertainment production, um, leadership within uh, those industries. And they're going to change probably more than anybody because of AI. It, it's going to have a huge impact. So, so they're adjusting their curriculums to help train students for what is to come um, because it's not going to look anything like it looks today uh, in, in those type of industries. Do you see any opportunities that the, uh, the the sector could provide? Like, say you get your A&P licensure, you know, from an AIM school. Do you see any emergent, um, like, let's say it could be leadership, it could be communication. Do you see anything that maybe is the next horizon to where you not only have the licensure, but you're taking yourself to the next level day one of employment? Well, that gets into stackable credentials. And, and that's a big issue with career schools, which means you you build upon the base. Uh, you, you, you get a credential in, in some field of study, and then you stack additional credentials and, and skills on top of that. And that changes over time based upon what we just talked about, the changing work environment. So I do think there's tremendous opportunity to go down that road. And, and many of our schools are already doing that. Absolutely. Yeah, I, we'll uh, we'll make sure that we we put this on there. But I I was listening to uh, one of your your podcast episodes about um, I don't think you call I don't think they call them soft skills. I can't remember the terminology that you used. Uh, but you had a guest on there talking about um, maybe you can help. You, you you probably heard the episode about durable skills. durable skills. That's what it was. Yeah. yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's something that a lot of times people don't think of that can be a huge advantage of uh, career schools. Well, soft skills are very important too. So th that's important to think about. Durable skills are the skills that translate across different professions and, uh, you know, just in life generally, you know, being able to uh, you know, leadership qualities, you know, th uh, business management, th things that are going to help you throughout your career. And uh, that podcast episode was very interesting because they were talking about the difference between schools and the success rate of students in the long term, because there have has been some research on this, uh, when they learn those durable skills, how to write well, you know, being a good writer, being a good public speaker, being being able to socialize and, and, and interact with people without having to do it by text on your phone, whatever it might be. Um, those are durable skills. Those are skills that are going to last you throughout your life. And they're going to be, a, you're going to be able to translate those across different fields of study and just in your personal life. Soft skills are uh, the ability, you know, a lot of, again, especially with students who come from a, a difficult background, Often they don't relate well to people. They're shy. They're not 
they're per, you know, they, they don't have an outgoing personality and, you know, being an extrovert. Um, so a soft, the soft skills are, are more about, you, you know, you, you can be technically competent at what you do, but if you can't relate to people effectively, it's going to really hold you back in your career. So being able to teach students soft skills is important. And, and in a field like, let, let's use cosmetology as an example, business and entrepreneurship is important. So you learn the technical skills of everything that goes into the beauty and wellness sector, cosmetology, uh, massage therapy, whatever it might be. But you have an opportunity to run your own business at some point. You build a client base. That's you know, those those are entrepreneurs, too. So being able to teach those students business skills, entrepreneurial skills and the soft skills to go along with the customer service aspect, finance, uh, financial literacy. Um, those are things that people don't really think about, but they're really important to students as they grow in their career and if they want to own their own business. Can you share a couple, because I know you did at the conference, can you share a couple of success stories when it comes to just like uh, specific examples that you gave um, of people that specifically came from um, a career school? There's so many, and, and I, I don't, there, there, there's one in particular, there's, there's a lot, but uh, the entertainment school has had, has had uh, full sale university in Florida, but there are others, um, but full sale in particular, every year when the Grammys, the Emmys, the Oscars are announced, they will have literally dozens of students that are in, in either nominated themselves or among teams that are nominated. So graduates. Wow. Uh, and, and, and then invariably, you know, when the winners are announced, there, there's some number of them too. Uh, so every year you have that, w w which is really exciting. But I think one of the ones you might be referring to that, that I talk about because it's just so incredible is the CEO of Intel, the, you know, enormous mm -hmm. Fortune 500 you know, incredibly important company, Intel, their CEO is a graduate of a for-profit school, uh, Lincoln Tech in Allentown, Lincoln Technical Institute in Allentown. He uh, grew up in a rural community. I think it was an Amish community and uh, had an aptitude for math, which everybody could see. He matriculated at Lincoln Tech. He got an AA there. Uh, everyone could see he was a genius and, and had high, you know, a great future in front of him. So then Intel hired him and he worked his way up and he's now the CEO of Intel. And he got that start at a for-profit school because he came from a community where that was really his only option at the time. So that's definitely a 99.9 .9 percentile aspect of, you know, who the graduates are, but, sure. um, the, you know, those are the kind of people that our schools serve every day and they may not become the CEO of fortune 500 company, but they're going to be a lot better off in their life and have uh, a skilled trade that they can carry with them throughout their career. Yeah. That's awesome. That's isn't that fascinating, Jason. I think I was telling you about the, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, is there, um, where all can, somebody find you Jason like or and find CQ and and all that they can find CQ through our website career.org we have a podcast called career education report which has a, a pretty strong following we we get a lot of good uh feedback on that we we've had some pretty high profile guests recently so career education report i think if you just google that again CQ's acronym is C E C U and uh, on our website, you'll see we have a magazine, we have daily news clips that anyone can sign up for to keep up with what's happening in career education. And then uh, me personally, if anyone for, well, I don't know why you would, but if you were interested <laughs> in, in uh, learning more, uh, I have a website, which is just my name, jasonaltmeyer.com. And uh, that talks about what I do now, but also talks about some other stuff that I do. Any uh, any political ventures in your future? You going you going to run for president? <laughs> no, I'm done. I'm <laughs> done. This is this is a fascinating time, and you know people are going to look back a hundred years from now. and They're going to say, "Wow, wouldn't it have been interesting 
to live in 2024. Oh my gosh. What must that Seriously. have been like to have just such eccentric characters and such twists and turns in, in an election like we've literally never seen in the history of the country and, and we're living it right now. And I think we kind of take that for granted, but um, what has happened over the past few months in our national politics is breathtaking. And the outcome of the election is going to be hugely important for the country, but also for the career schools that we're talking about. So everyone, regardless of your politics should definitely be paying attention and participate and absolutely vote. Sure. And I mean, like this, even if, even for, um, even for entertainment purposes, best reality TV that you can, you can find right now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for the name of our podcast, uh, mosaic minds, I want to step a little bit out of our current conversation, uh, representing, uh, Pennsylvania, you know, during your political acumen over the years, I'm going to talk sports with you if you don't mind, cause I'm a huge sports guy growing up in Indiana, but I'm going to go out off the beaten path a little bit. Talk to me a little bit about the Little League World Series there in Pennsylvania. I I, yeah, I, I played we, it. I was town and country. We weren't Little League, so we never could play, nor were we good enough. But talk to me a little bit about that sporting event. Williamsport, it, it's awesome. So it's a town in the middle of Pennsylvania. The, the, the whole region revolves around the little league world series. So every year they come in and, you know, there's, there's two aspects of it. There's the American team. So, so there's a uh, competition to see who the finalist is going to be representing the United States. And then there's a foreign opponent for the United States team. So it's just kind of cool to watch it happen on both sides and different countries are playing each other and different, uh, you know, and they're, they're, this part is not always in Williamsport. You know, it works its way up. But um, when they get to the finals, the you know, and, and the playoff aspect of it, the Little League World Series, it just the whole town just revolves around this. And to see these young, uh, I guess they're eleven, twelve yes. age, approximately that that you know, young kids, uh, it just having the time of their life and and having the spotlight shine upon them it's just really cool to watch and and you can see it on i think espn covers it it's definitely on tv it's it's fun you know it's kids having fun but they take it seriously and if you win you are the world exactly. champions legitimately because you have beaten the best team and these are all-star teams you know for, from the other countries these are the absolute best that the other countries have so it, it it's a big deal for these and they will certainly remember it for the rest of their lives i think it's very nice to interview someone like yourself you know you're you're fully humble you're 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 fighting for what i believe is a good cause you know what i mean the, the service in underutilized industries you know keep doing keep fighting a good fight you know it, it was a pleasure meeting you uh talking with you I know Nick had great things to say about you, and I look forward to this day. I, I couldn't wait to to get out of work and uh, have this conversation. So I know it's been a pleasure for me representing the sector and having someone fighting for the causes and uh, and and being very humble to talk with us and spend time out of their evening, you know, to give us information about the sector as a whole. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time out for us, Jason. I am happy to do it. I appreciate you asking. And uh, next time, if you want to spend the whole time talking sports, we can do that too. <laughs> Jason, well, Jason would fun. love that. <laughs> <laughs> I had to keep it to a minimum because I like the topic. I'm, I'm very passionate about it. You know, I spent some of my early days on spring break. You know, mom and dad were high school special needs instructors. Sister oversees the language department at a local high school. And then I'm for profit education sector. So we've had some interesting meetings and uh, this was informational. It was it was neat for me to see the side that you operate under as opposed to seeing, you know, the side that I operate under. So I think that's uh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I like I love the bipartisan attitude exactly. uh, towards towards education in general. You know, I think that I think that everybody a lot of times has to put everything in one box or the other. So I love the fact that, um, you know, that it's it's you, we're not we're not slamming Republicans or we're not slamming Democrats. We're just saying, hey, we need to all come together for this common good because it is you know it's really important yeah you have to get along with both sides and as a country we need to be better at that all right jason well hey you have a great evening and hey maybe we can have you back sometime thank you appreciate you having me on absolutely take care